Thanks, Lucy. So it's a great pleasure to be here uh, with you, Leo and Victor. So it's Leo Orta, Victor Miklos, and I am identifying them by name, although as we will discover, anonymity versus authorship is one of the key dialectics of their practice. What we're going to do today is a little unusual. In fact, this whole thing is a little unusual because um, these guys are new arrivals on the design and performance scene. Um, so very much in contrast to, let's say, Ron Arad, who we'll be talking to on Friday, who's been working for uh, 40 years. Um, this practice is just emerging now from Eindhoven Design Academy. So just to give you a little bit of a sense of the mood of this new and uh, bristling neo-avant-garde practice, we thought we would start with a short video or teaser that they've made, which I'm going to go ahead and show you now. All right. So guys, welcome. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about where you come from, what the practice is all about, uh, where you are now? Hi, everyone. Um, so we both at the moment uh, confined uh, to Studio Orta Le Moulin. It's an hour outside of Paris in France. And uh, we are both also uh, here with the team and uh, some of the people in the meal also. Um, what else is going on? We're preparing the show for our upcoming show inside here, but we're also well, uh, well healthy and well secured uh, about the situation going on outside. Yeah, I guess coming from completely, I'm from Denmark and you're from Paris. From France, from Paris. Yeah. Um, I don't know, like, yeah, we met each other at the Design Academy in Eindhoven, and uh, now we're here. Yeah. We, like, we were together. Actually, we started the Design Academy uh, Eindhoven and we were at the, in the same class the first year over there mm -hmm. and we were at one point we, we started like uh, we, we were in a group project together and you know like things were just rolling on on the project and we started like becoming very good friends we very have like a, a same vision mentality on, of our works and we decided to over summer just to, to meet up and to, to continue enjoying like uh, the fun we were having in the first year Mm -hmm. and doing things over the uh, my parents' studio in France, where we are at the moment. And that's a little bit how, how things started. You know, we just started making things. Yeah. Very and out of uh, intuition. Yeah. One of the distinctive things about the practice, I guess, is in a way that you're leaping ahead of yourselves almost consciously and on purpose. Like yeah. in that first couple of years that you were active, you were already starting to think about guerrilla interventions into shows where you hadn't necessarily been invited, for example. 
We have, I think that was one of our first observations and also when we were new and bright in Eindhoven, we saw this whole construction, there was the design week in Eindhoven and mm. it felt like there was not really a voice for performance and for the young designers, for design in general that was not just focused on the on the object and these like, and the, kind and of the, and, the, and product also. Yeah, yeah exactly. Mm -hmm. Like and, and everything on pedestals and these things. So we wanted to try to go in and disrupt this a bit and, and we found performance. Uh, I think also quite inspired by your parents' work and these kind of things. But performance was really a way for us to get in there and and yeah, to to kind of take people uh, and take them out of their comfort zone because design for us is not necessarily just like these pleasant things at all. It should, how to say, it, cater to all kinds of different uh, mm. human traits, right? So, yeah, it was really important for us to to kind of to voice ourselves, and yeah, it was quite necessary. So, within the second year of the academy, you know, after the summer, talking about how you know we could enter a little bit that scene and, and talk about things rather than making things, talk and perform about it. We were using, you know, like the, our evenings, our weekends uh, in, a, in a shared studio space that, were, that was, I don't know, the size of a, of a toilet, you know, we were <laughs> four designers in that room and we had like, like not even a, a space on the desk, you know, and we, were, we just brought the sewing machine and that was the beginning of, of making suits and, and trying to uh, to to create like those not the, it's not an alter ego it's just uh, a person a character that talks about something you know like like a silhouette like a silhouette like a, uh, somebody that draws characters like animation he will create like characters give them identity give them char characteristics and we were a little bit creating some something like that a body that doesn't show any human characteristic, but it, that can speak about those human interactions and, and the, the human interaction towards design necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. So do you, do you think that by occupying that uh, sense of a kind of anim anonymous, pseudo anonymous character and simultaneously invading these protocols or structures of design that you are in some way expressing a, I almost want to call it a generational attitude to authorship as being something more slippery or more contested, more authorship more as like a conflict zone than a sort of secure anchor? I think the, it's a very broad question in, in the sense that um, I think there's very many young designers that feels like they have been overlooked. Yeah. Uh, and, and we have such a, a huge pool of uh, young designers that uh, have so great talent and, and work so also like avant-garde in, in, in their fields. Um, you have the whole generation of information, right? Like in, in the old days, you had the, the big uh, charismatic designers, like nearly like um, design icons. Uh, now, uh, all of this information and learning about creative processes is available and, and and all this knowledge that before you had to live through is available with a click. Uh, so, so many young designers have so much to say and, and such a great perspective on the world that, that you know, it's just, yeah, um, it's, it's, it's a shame that there's no platform for this in, in, in the kind of like the, the ordinary design uh, mm -hmm. world. Uh, and, and we feel like that's really uh, a shame. I mean, at least that, what is, that is what we thought when we were studying a lot, you know, we're like, we were still students. It was, we, 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 we were missing that need of like uh, being able to express, you know, and as soon as we were doing that project about revealing all this, the school started doing a platform where uh, it became an arena where people can express. So there's dialogue, there's performance, there's video that are shown over there. And that was already like the start of, of something new, you know, not only finished products, but like the process that goes along, debates along certain topics, uh, performance that had no space in, in a fair and that could have like a space on stage. Mm. Uh, so all this was uh, the twist already something happening. Yeah. Well, let's look at um, a, a couple of images of you guys in action because that's such an important aspect of what you do where the design object is both like a prop and a theatrical experience and a, and a performance, but it also is in a way, the result that is the most important thing. One thing that I think is really interesting about what you guys do 
is that it's like you are actors, but you're more in service to the object. So it's not like there's a script or a play. It's like everything is what the object demands in some way. Yeah. And then you're also operating in this way visually where you seem simultaneously like avant-garde performers and you also seem like workers, like working class artisans in some way. So there's a lot of like dualism in, in the process of um, unveiling your objects in real life. So here we see um, a shot of you starting to carve into the foam and maybe you could just describe these performances for people who haven't seen them. No, no, it's, <laughs> they're quite they're long. <laughs> it's, it all started actually, um, you know, when we, when we were inter on internship, we had to do an internship mm -hmm. and uh, we both were uh, like very occupied with the, the, the internship we were doing and with school and everything. But at that same time, we had the, um, we had a commission, commission work uh, starting. Like, so what you, what you can see on the pictures here is us as a studio with a huge um, EPS polystyrene block phone. And um, it got, uh, it all started with Functional Art Gallery, um, Kaleidoscope Magazine, Slam Jam, and Carhartt VIP. Mm. Uh, collaboration in between each other for the third year's uh, anniversary of Slam Jam. Uh, all these people co-created like uh, an event during PT Wumo. And yep. basically, yeah, that. Um, yeah. what happens a lot um, also within the fashion world is that the, um, a lot of events uh, are uh, how do you say um, uses I, I mean like uses the performance and the activation of uh, of such an events within several music performance installation scene. So we automatically started like looking into our words when we create like a, an object, creating like that whole story that goes along and how, how does it start, how does it uh, comes here and then all the process involved in, in that making of that same object. So yeah, I think what you can kind of take from how we worked before, um, where we were kind of intruding and going in and taking over a already created space. I think this was more like, as you said, also like theatrical. Um, uh, like I think how we talk about it is more like it's, it's, it's like stepping into a different uh, universe or atmosphere. Um, so here we had the whole uh, museum and what we wanted to create was kind of, or was, was uh, steps in our own production. So it shouldn't seem like a show that had a start and an end. It was more like a continuation in, in, in what we were, how to say, like created a big factory. And you could follow our steps of, of carving and creating these objects that were exactly um, this conversation between the, 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 the hard labor of the body and then, you know, divided down into the different kind of um, um, have refinements of different materials and reactions. Mm -hmm. um, so we had, it's also a conversation that started also with, with the collaboration of these brands. You know, Slam Jam is a, a, street, a streetwear um, retailer and Car Vip um, sells and retails like a lot of uh, workwear clothes. So we wanted to, to discuss also with these brands and see how, you know, what is the role of the designer in all this? You know, we're making furniture, but how does, you know, the creation of that, those furniture also enacts mm -hmm. uh, the craftsmanship, the artist's uh, um, creation, uh, design, and how does all that kind of merge, you know? Like the clothes that we wear, like the, how we wear the clothes. I mean, the first one of, I remember one of the first ideas uh, was, okay, when we wear clothes in the studio, we wear our casual clothes, just because we have to do a little thing in the studio. Five minutes after, it gets dirty. So how do, from that, we can, uh, create also like a, uh, a piece of clothing that is used for both situation work and casual life, you know? Mm -hmm. and so that was also a, a conversation that started like uh, in between our creation and also the collaboration with the brands, you know, like how those links start. Yeah. yeah and, and then there's also um, an additional triangulation there because as much as you're dealing with the clothing that you're wearing and the furniture that you're making, you're also operating in this museum space with these cast bronze objects by Marina Marini mostly. And so you have also a relationship between this invented process of foam mm. construction and this much more permanent 
authoritative artistic material that and the two things are talking to each other very much in the same way that your pseudo workwear art gear is talking to commercial fashion mm -hmm. the objects are also speaking to the artworks around you yeah, you know when we first started to visit the space with kaleidoscope magazine and we entered uh, we entered the space we saw the whole uh, different layers of, of uh, architectural style inside the building uh, being you know in florence and the building having like a having such a strong character, you know? Mm. It was also a play of how do you actually leave a voice to all the people that have created something in that museum, let's say Marino Marini, all the architects, and how do we also implement that? You know, like we were looking at images of Marino Marini uh, sculpting back in, back in the days, and like all the process of, processes of a sculpture back in that time is so different from what we, we do today with polystyrene. Polystyrene is, mm. is a, is a modern thing. It's like a, a really nowadays thing, and I mean, like you can't uh, carve what uh, Marino Marini did in such a time today. And so, all these questions was also something we wanted to look at. You know, uh, bringing um, today's contemporary way of creating things towards that the whole layering of those years inside that same museum. Yeah, yeah. 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 Say that the roughness was, yeah. yeah, the roughness of his, uh, especially his big. Uh, men on horses, uh, the one in the middle uh, you were seeing before. And uh, you can really see the process of his, both his hands um, and his techniques in it. Um, and I think that's exactly what we are also showing in, in our works, but in very different material, of course. But I think- Can I ask, can I ask, can I ask you a kind of philosophical question about that, about how you fit into a broader lineage? Because I, I'm tempted to call you guys, your, your practice, neo-avant-garde in a sense that it's taking place in response to a long avant-garde trajectory that goes back for more than a hundred years now. But I, I feel like that idea of you being on fast forward in some ways, or in this kind of very sped up clip has to do with how you've approached your practice, like I said, jumping into situations before you're invited, or also the sense that the work can happen before your eyes in this chainsaw, spray <laughs> of foam you know pieces around the room so the sense that things are happening at this incredible rate of invention and it feels to me like there's something that has to do there with capitulating or responding to the avant-garde history that you're receiving over the course of the last century and i'd love to hear you guys talk about that like what do you have to do with the bauhaus what do you have to do with viennese action school and other performance art precedents and how do you think of yourselves standing in that art historical flow yeah, I think um, when we the, it's always tough, right? Because when when, when we talk about really uh, being so um, intuitive and, and reactive in in a certain sense, uh, you have to be aware of all of these things. But you also have to forget them again to not be uh, too controlled by them. Um, and we talk about a lot like uh, using like th these things are so subconscious uh, in our work, uh, especially in the in the action itself. Mm -hmm. uh, that that if you how to say it, like if you are too much a slave of of, of these old schools, um, it's it's really it's really easy to stop up and think all the time of what it means and and, and the sim symbolism. Um, but I think for us, uh, we respect uh, a lot what has been done before, and I think we see a lot in in our work uh, the previous schools. Um, but. I think for us, it's more about like, yeah, like the action, like really liberating ourselves. Um, mm. I think if we talk, for example, about Bauhaus, the object, and, and for example, the, the, the dance, um, the ballets, um, I think that there is a certain, <laughs> yeah, I don't know, like a, a rough translation of that and what we are, what we are doing, but instead of presenting it on a stage, we we just create these these happenings, but where the where the acts are surreal in a sense, but they somehow relate to the energy and the material and and and, and the kind of uh, narrative that is going on still. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean it's all all this uh, this history about design is is part of us. You know, when we when we when we've been educated at the design academy, you know, we automatically uh, uh, precedes and group design, uh, 
uh, Memphis Design, then Bauhaus, you precede all these names and you study them. So you have them in the back of the head, you know, constantly. And for example, I'll take an example uh, of, uh, of a recent work which is done for, uh, in the studio within the past weeks. And we, we have been citing Bauhaus and the colors and the shapes within a, within a body of work, but then distorted that again, you know, so the, the spontaneity, the intuitivity and the spontaneous aspect of creating will lead automatically to these to these to these past movements and and then we'll we'll discuss about them and we'll try to not not saying go beyond but like leave them on the side and also try to go to something different you know and not necessarily say okay that that's bad so that's that is this yeah. you know so they automatically come because these people have done everything before but we're trying to you know like uh, to to look at it and and continue uh, with what we have behind the mind. So really let the expression go out, you know, and, and then we can come back again on it and talk about it, you know. But I think it's, yeah. it's good to not stay blocked on, okay, this is that, this is that, this is that. Otherwise, you never move, you know. I mean, I've heard um, one of the people working with me, like two people of the work with me think, oh, that's, that's like Memphis. Yeah, it is like Memphis, maybe. It looks like Memphis, but maybe it is, it is also something else, you know. Yeah. I think it, the, the key thing that I'm taking from what you're saying is that it's absolutely vital to know your history, but you need to know the history to liberate yourself rather than constrain yourself. And it's about yeah. using new energy into that tradition while respecting its significance and importance to what you're doing. And I'm sure, you know, people looking at these images of your objects now that I'm showing them um, will perhaps be reminded of certain things, whether it's 18th century upholstered furniture or Memphis or Studio Alchemia or whatever it is. Even more contemporary. I mean, some people could say it's Max Lamb or it looks like Gaetano mm -hmm. Pesce, but yeah, of course, we, we, yeah. we live, in a, we live in, a, in a open information culture. So all this yeah. information just comes in the head and we have to process it, you know, um, even integrate some of the processes that we see elsewhere and then move beyond, you know, I mean, we can, we can always be compared to other people, but I think it's also important to, to acknowledge that you cannot be so different from any other people also, because we're so many on the planet and we're doing a lot of the, a lot of the same things, but in a different time zone, in different moments. Uh, yeah. So can you, having said all that, you also do have a very strong aesthetic in the work. Uh, it seems to me. And so now that people have seen a few of these images, if they weren't familiar with them before, I wonder whether you could talk about the particular approach that you have to materials and form. And it, to me, they seem incredibly energetic and very improvisatory, but they also have a lot of presence and a lot of distinctiveness. Like they don't just seem like random results. And I wonder um, how you think about that. And maybe one thing I could sort of throw at you as a suggestion is that it seems to me like you are becoming sort of like jazz musicians who have a very strong sense of repertoire and structure so that when you actually step up onto the stage and improvise, you, ha you kind of know where you're going, but you don't know exactly where you're going, but you know kind of the territory you want to be operating in. And I wonder what you guys think about all those questions about formal design. I think it's in the, also being a duo, there is a difference between Leo, he attacks some of the work and how I attack the works. Uh -huh. um, and I think that's very crucial. As you say, like in music, um, if you really want to jam together, you have to trust each other completely. And that trust comes uh, from like a, a long time of like working next to each other and, and a lot of dialogue. Uh, and when you work so intuitively with so much energy, you have to really support each other and each other's ideas, even though you don't see them right away. Um, because it, it, you don't want to limit the, the, the possibilities of this object to, to, to you know, go uh, beyond, um, beyond where you, you, you took the previous one. You know, like it's a continuation of, of the work that you just did, you know, 10 minutes ago. Um, so it's like a constant dialogue between you, the craft that you know, uh, forgetting that craft again and the first idea and moving on yeah. from that first idea you know it's really action reflection action reflection constantly having a conversation mm -hmm. between you and the piece and you and your partner and you and the piece constantly you know it's like sometimes i ask to victor okay what are you going to do right now like for for that chair or for that that object you're doing and he's like i don't know i have that shape with a little bit of metal and sculpting it and 
and the shape appears and we talk about it, oh, that's not going to be so comfortable, that shape is not going to go so well in that position. Uh, you know, a lot of people will ask, do you, do you sketch as a first, uh, first thing? And I never see uh, a sketch as something that should be the final product, but more as a skeleton for a piece, yeah. you know? Like, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll sketch the, the metal structure, the bones of the work, and then from that, we can create something on top, and that is always area evolving. You know, I had made some piece, I'm more into like the control uh, kind of uh, mentality and, uh, and work process, but I, I have made some work that looks exactly like the drawing, but I'm more and more also tempted to like, you know, leave that away and, and, and like get all the process along and the discussion along. That is always happening in the in recent works, you know. Can you um, say a little bit more about what the difference is in your two approaches are? Like, Victor, you just said the way that you both attack the furniture, which is an interesting yeah. word. Does it implies yeah, kind of maybe it actually is because I feel like I attack things and I also feel uh, sometimes bad for the materials. <laughs> 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 okay. Yeah, like, like I think, um, but I think that's also a little bit where, where we are different maybe because I really sometimes I just like tunnel vision something, I just go for it um, and I forget everything around me. Uh, Leo is a little bit more planned sometimes, you do a little sketch, but also more and more you also just go yeah. for it. And actually more and more I look at Leo's process and I'm like, oh yeah, I stop off sometimes and I do a little sketch. <laughs> so, you know, like, yeah, yeah, you, you really like are learning from each other in this process, but, um, but we, without being aware of it before you really look back on it. Because we are so much making all the time and we have to if we really want to, to push our ideas. But um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the... The first work we, we, we started doing together are uh, a lot about things that we didn't know. You know, I we didn't know how to pour concrete, we didn't know how to mix concrete, we didn't know how to weave. But all these things are things that because we're ignorant, we're able to push <laughs> ignorant towards the, the, the making of these. We you know we're not not craftsmen because we haven't had like um, uh, education towards like how to pour concrete, how to do all this uh, polishing, how all this we didn't have. But you know like. With that information again that is available online, you're able to learn how to uh, to make mold, how to weave, and all this. Yeah. So being ignorant towards sometimes the materiality allows you to to push the limits of that material and try some things up. I mean, we didn't know that we could pour concrete in tights, you know, in stockings. But in the end, you know, we did it. The first piece broke, and then we work on that. We work upon something that can. I can hold on four feet and I can hold somebody and yeah, it's an evolution constantly. Yeah, yeah. The, um, we're now gonna be looking at this series of works that have uh, this very distinctive material that you're using, this electric cord, uh, mm -hmm. which kind of resembles the way that a traditional caned chair or some other upholstery material or you know, woven grass might have been used in a historic um, context. And as you say, we're also seeing the, the uh, this, cast concrete in the stockings so it makes this very kind of giacometti like sort of surrealistic profile um, i wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the use of this particular material the electric cord and why it's become such a signature for you well i think like many materials and especially how we started out like being two students um, both on student loans and things like this we <laughs> didn't really have any money at all for any materials so like the concrete, cheap industrial material, the, the steel, the, the power cords we found in a, in a recycling yard. Um, so I think we would constantly be looking for materials. Um, yeah, and I think from the beginning we had this idea that 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 it's it's quite easy to make something uh, with like refined materials because they are already so. Um, they already have such an identity also historically being used. Um, so it's way more interesting to try to take the materials that is immediately around us. We had this talk about like, what is two meters around you? Like, you know, just look around. What is, what in that uh, circumference, uh, what can, can you somehow um, manipulate those materials? Can, can, you, can you take them out of that, um, yeah, of that identity that, yeah, represents your habitat and, and, you know, deform them in such a way that, that they present a completely new aesthetic, a new reaction, a new emotion. Um, and you use also. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because, you know, if I take the example of the, of the electric chair shown just here, 
um, concrete, uh, raw concrete and electric wires are things in the house that you are, like that are like mostly covered. You know, we paint concrete, we'll hide electrical wires, and we were like, okay, why try to do that when you can also embellish nobles and 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 work with them? So you know, we had the the chance, and we are very grateful to the Netherlands for having that. They have those recycling centers <laughs> where you can go throw things, but you can also go and buy what people throw. And throw. Yeah, it's, it's a treasure <laughs> yeah, for this, for an artist or for designer, true. basically. So we were going over there, and one time we just, like, face, uh, I don't know, maybe six meter high uh, a mountain pot. of cables. And, <laughs> and I'm, you know, I, have that, I have that thing that just shines in my head. I'm like, oh, I got to buy it. I don't know, like what I can put on my bike and I try to do something with it, you know? <laughs> I get, we had like a three-wheel bike, which I sported everything on. Yeah. <laughs> everything was so, yeah, DIY. So, yeah. so, 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 you know, like those materials also start creating a, uh, a conversation towards an object. It's not okay trying to do just a chair. It's also mm. you know, looking at what a material says about, uh, about uh, an interior, about a lifestyle, about yeah. A quality, a quality, a quality of connectivity. So yeah. when you look at like electrical wires, you know, people tend to hide them underneath the walls, uh, like underneath the ground. They go from a country to another through, through the ocean. And it's the one thing that are connecting us right now. So, yeah. Yeah. Somehow. So I wanted to, you know, like when I saw them, I had in mind something that, you know, can be weaved, connected and support a little bit like, uh, what we need so it became a lamp because you know the the, the function of the light will lighten up uh, what you can read on, on the chair and you know it will it will um, it will give an extra function towards the electric um, the um, how do you say the, the electric uh, um, yeah. power of those uh, wires so and it's the it's the the, you're sitting on something that potentially can kill you right so yep. it's also a, a, electric chair right a interesting thing yeah. about an object that uh, many, probably not many people see as a quality, but I would say like I definitely see it as a quality. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's also about challenging what the, what what an object should be and what it can be. Uh, there's a there's like a combination of nakedness and brutality in the sense that you have this uh, material that's been unveiled and left open to view, but also it is an industrial material. It makes me think about the way that you're inheriting the tradition of brutalism. But I would also say that's a, that um, is a really important dynamic in the performances as well, right? That combination of aggression and vulnerability. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to show a few other Im images of you guys at work um, in these actual live events that you stage. And maybe you could talk a little bit about them as we look at them. So here's one at the Berlin Festival from last year, for example, which features this uh, wire material very extensively. Yeah. Um, this one in particular, um, this one we worked with uh, hierarchies and um, and also the loss of uh, identity uh, when talking about like the whole infrastructure of the cables. Um, and we built these two thrones, um, and the, the the kind of the the musicians that we worked with are uh, two very good friends of us that composed this. Uh, uh, yeah. It is a composition, but it's also improvised, just like our performances. Mm -hmm. And it's about like the desperation of getting lost in, 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 in this kind of duality of your identity, right? Like you, all of a sudden you have two, like one you take care of online and one you, you know, like you are a slave to in the real world. Um, and this was kind of like an act of spreading it out as much as you can. So it was like a, a, a very big spider's web of cables that just kept on uh, Mm. growing and growing and growing and the tempo kept on rising and rising and rising and rising and the desperation in the end uh, is, is so tough and dark that you uh, performing it is it's impossible because it, the rhythm becomes faster than it's humanly possible to 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 sustain it and 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 there's cable everywhere so you get completely entangled and, and yeah so it's not so much an uh, an act in the sense of being an actor, it's more like 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 a physical, just like depletion, uh, mm -hmm. controlled by these two, uh, how to say, like uh, characters that are that set the pace of your work. So it's also about like that continuous pace of work and and like that repetition in mechanisms that we work so much with. Um, so 
yeah, uh, that was pretty much it. <laughs> also making the, the networks that we find ourselves in. Exactly. So it's kind of like, it, as the worker, you are, you, are, you are a slave to the network, but you are also the one creating it and, and sustaining yeah. it. So, so that's a choice that I think many people don't really, yeah, really, yeah. What have. about the, um, the striped uniforms? And uniform is a really important word for you guys, I know. You know you're wearing the mask now and you always present yourself in some way as being um, generic, I want to say, but also kind of avant-garde generic. <laughs> you know, it's an interesting combination of qualities. Um, so how about these particular outfits that you guys uh, had made for the for performance? Yeah. For this specific performance, it was um, uh, a project for a reference festival, reference Berlin festival, mm -hmm. and it was a collaborative project with Martin Rose. So, mm -hmm. uh, as every time we perform an idea behind an object, so here you can see Arnold's uh, armchair um, based on Arnold Schwarzenegger, and. <laughs> Depending on each of the objects, there's a certain character coming out of it. So when we when we got announced that um, we were gonna work with Martin Rose, we automatically looked at the outfit that could be possible and could match a little bit that that character. You know, so mm -hmm. we had the chance to, to to look into like the I think it was summer spring um, 2019 collection, but. To come to the to the to the idea of the uniform, every time we have that object, the character has to be kind of um, anonymous. So mm -hmm. all the all the expression and the ideas coming out of the performance are um, out of uh, how do you say expression. You can't um, de uh, define who is the person, what age, what gender, what. What is all that? So the, the idea of like having the hands, the, the the body covered and the face covered is to give only all the attention to what is the action going on or the object presented. Yeah. So that so that the human body disappears a little bit and it's more about that thing happening rather than uh, the person enacting it. Well, let's look at um, one more performance, and I think that what you're describing is really palpable in these images. Um, and again, you have a very strong sense of this um, team of beings who are not in any way particularized, so you can't kind of set up, get a sense of personality. Um, and I was also interested to ask you about both this specific performance and also how you're thinking about other artistic gestures like that. The one that occurs to me as an American is the Gorilla Girls, you know, the feminist collective that always had the gorilla masks on who used anonymity in a really powerful, politicized way. Um, so I'm interested whether you kind of look at references like that, but also if you could just tell us a little bit about this particular performance that happened in Poland last summer. I think, uh, first of all, come, uh, it's, it's, really, um, uh, it's really a nice comparison, I think, uh, with the Gorilla Girls, but I would also say, like, I have so much respect for what they're doing that I will not uh, uh, intrude on, on, on any of the things that, that, um, that, that, that they're doing. But um, I think that that it just come like uh, the whole thing with the mask and, and the, the and, and anonymity comes from our like original first performances mm -hmm. because we are also not performers, so we didn't want it to be acts. We wanted to be real. And the only way for us actually to 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 kind of have the strength and the courage to do this was to use masks mm -hmm. um, as well as as the whole idea of creating these characters. It, it was definitely a part of it that that we were ner we nervous <laughs> like completely. Uh, uh, it's it's not easy. Um, and if we're talking about this this performance in particular, it's a, it's it's a development of of the previous one. And it's combined with another project we did, um, where you can see all the uniforms are quite uh, colorful, uh, colorful, a lot of pattern. Yeah, <laughs> and there are the one uh, uniforms we have collected during our travels all over the world. Uh, some are from Iran, some are from America, some are from uh, I think we had from uh, Chile and China. Uh, we have from France, we have from Denmark. Uh, um, and, and without uh, characterizing them as where they're from, they kind of become one kind of anonymous family 
that are still working together to create and to develop this giant network that is kind of consuming them. So, so we added this layer of, of, of all these, like, uh, and I have to say that the, all of the textiles are very traditional. Um, how all these traditions and cultures also get sucked in and their identities kind of get blurred and trendy or, or, or whatnot. You know, for example, we could, we could buy some, some textiles in a country that are totally not from there, that are totally not crafted from there, but are also over there. So we, when looking at these textiles, we were looking into uh, uh, not handcrafted, but like um, nationally or um, or traditionally. traditionally made in the in the place that we were buying them. Um, so when you bring them together, they all have that cultural background and they all merge together, but with that with that in mind, you know, with that mm -hmm. cultural in mind and, and all, all this idea also merged again with that connectivity, you know, you're pulling into cables within a country to another, so you, you kind of like pulling a force, giving a force to another, and all this is being led by, by sound, you know, the artist yeah. improvises with the movement and the performers also, you know, with the rhythm of the, of the sounds start acting you know yeah yeah it was of course we're only getting a very um slight impression of it from this one image of it but i hope people can get a sense of what that might be like i can scale it up real quick like we had uh, 16 professional uh, uh, yeah like basically yeah but they were like circus performers yeah. so yeah. yeah really professionals yeah. Um, can we t talk about one other um, slightly different topic in terms of the presentation or display of your work, which is just what happens when the objects go off and end up on platforms and in galleries? <laughs> because it's so different to see your work in that kind of intense Gesamtkunstwerk, total commitment, all in kind of context, and then have these very um, different contexts for what you're doing here, for example, in head to head comparison with an Eileen Gray which of course brings up that question of the legacy of modernism we were talking about earlier. But how do you guys feel when you see one of these amazing things that you've made kind of stuck <laughs> on a, on a <laughs> how, how do, what do you I'm think like, about that? Does it seem okay to you or? I, when I look at it now, I'm like, okay, Ellen Gray did such a good job to keep like simplicity. And, yeah. And, <laughs> what did we do? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but you know, every day I, I when I when I have to not argue, but when I you know even today my parents said like okay, but uh, how do you sit on that? I'm like, mom, dad, this is not about how do you sit and how comfortable you are, but it's all about what is behind that, you know. Mm. So that's exactly what we're seeing here. You know, it's not about uh, a chair that can slide under a table that have armrests so you can actually sit, but it's also talking about revealing the materiality, revealing like the revealing the whole uh, process making also in, in yeah. the so yeah create character a lot of character right like so, so also like how like how do you feel when you're sitting on the thing how how is your kind of how can we can we can we get somewhere where you feel like you connect to this piece uh, more than uh, mm. say, like a repetition of of, mm. of something uh, uh, else um, yeah, so it's it's very important to us to create things that that that, that challenges this idea of, of what an object is. Also, so there is a chance that people actually can connect with it on a personal level, mm. uh, because yeah, like it's it's, it's flowing, but don't right? We always throw for me, out. For me, also, it's also said in the in the title, you know, like it's just thrown. You know, like all our works we do are all unique and are all never going to be made again because mm. it's it's one thing we, we wouldn't be even able to produce it because it's not what we, we're trying to do we're trying to get that uniqueness yeah. and yeah. and the expression of, of the work inside it so they can't be used around the table like the one Elengre did but it, it is about you know uh, defying uh, also the way you're using uh, a piece of furniture you know like throne is giving so much identity towards something so it's also that one piece that talks about something yeah, yeah. and maybe you feel like a king sitting on it you know yeah, so, yeah. and that's okay or a queen yeah? you know yeah, yeah I mean, there's so much of what country though <laughs> <laughs> oh. i mean i to me i i love this image because i feel like you could teach an entire course about design history just from this one image but one thing i would observe is that the speed of your object is still preserved even when it's static. So 
the, the slow consideration and calibration of the Eileen Gray. And it's kind of, as you said, Leo, the way that it's kind of been tuned to this very kind of perfect state of itself. And then the kind of roughness and immediacy and uh, power also, and as you say, it's a throne. So power in that sense too, of the thing that you've made. I feel like they really, really vibrate powerfully in relation to one another. So for me, I think the work does survive its context of creation and absolutely telegraphs that after the fact. Um, we have a couple of other examples of your work shown in this way. This one has this fantastic title, which I'm not even gonna to try to pronounce, but it's the, it's the Latin species name of an octopus called the flapjack octopus. I had to look it up. <laughs> and it's obviously very kind of uh, eloquent in relation to the forms, um, this kind of wild asymmetrical gesture. Yeah, it's called in a net of missile. Um, yeah, again, uh, I think when we, when we look at, a, at an object, we look a lot of like as, 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 as if it's a character, right? Mm -hmm. so, so this character has, a, first of all, a skeleton, uh, then the muscles, and then the skin. Uh, if you want to create a character that, that feels like it's movement or like it's kind of frozen in that time, you have to think about the object in this way. Um, and, and, and then maybe functionality comes at a certain point uh, into it as well, because that's also really interesting when, when you talk about like these kind of domesticated uh, animals or characters that we are creating that you then you use. Um, so, yeah, I mean, in the end, if you think that way and you think about the tension of the muscles and, and, and the identity of the skin um, and the posture of the skeleton, if, then, you, come, yeah. if you come back to, to that, that blue chair with like the octopus one, oh, yeah. um, when we talk about skeleton, this is an, an exact good example of it. You know, like mm. I, I was looking at Victor, like uh, finalizing that chair, and he was like, okay, are we going to put uh, a fur or cushion <laughs> on it and everything? And I was like, no, the beauty about that chair is revealing how how it's how it is underneath but it's also you know we didn't know what it was before uh we named it Op uh, opistotetus chair you know it's mm -hmm. it is that uh, octopus that is entangled in that fish net you know yeah it is exactly that and you can see it around you can see that net that is uh, rusted that took him inside and that is that is killing it you know and and it's also revealing the the materiality of it and how concrete has to holds on, on steel to, to function also, you know? Mm -hmm. So revealing both, and I love that example just next to that chair that is yeah. you know, like a, a little bit scratched on the, on the steel and that there's wood planched just on it. So it's the perfect, uh, perfect combination of like, how do you reveal a material over time, you know? You don't have to use it and, and until, the, uh, until 50 years to, to know that it's actually still in the, underneath that paint, you know? I love the idea too of an object that's in a constant death struggle with itself, like the Lyakawan, you know, the famous sculpture of the guy with the snakes on him, you know. Um, I'm just gonna accelerate through the last images we have of your work in context of display. Uh, and now just showing a couple of images of the Friedman Bende summer show from last year in which you guys were included. So this was a group show um, with Misha Khan and Campana Brothers who we've already had on the exhibition uh, sorry, on the design and dialogue series, as well as uh, Wendell Castle and um, who else? Uh, Adam Silverman, who will be coming up uh, in, a, in a couple of weeks as well, uh, Andrea Bronzi and so on. So this is a kind of like Friedman Benda world, uh, Planet Friedman Benda, in which your work was included. Um, but I did wanna, um, before we turn to questions or as we turn to questions, I did wanna show one last video which is um, something that I think you guys have done just recently in France, if I'm not wrong. There's a couple more process shots. Gino. <laughs> yeah, who's who here, by the way? <laughs> That's Tino. It's me when I have long hair. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's one of, the, of our assistants in the studio. Yeah. Cool. We, we, have the, we have the luck of having a, a, a countryside studio, so we are uh, here with a small team all confined together, and you know, like enjoying the sun and being being in a good condition to be able to, you know, stay focused on the work, understand what's going on out there, and also uh, create things that are relevant towards what's going on out there. Yeah. But being, you know, healthy and and secure at the same time, you know. And this is, I think, this is Victor because there's some telltale yeah, hair there. Yeah, there's the the Danish uh, 
<laughs> hair peeking out in the back, right? It's the pose, I think. <laughs> and then this one last object, which is uh, new and will actually be featured in the Friedman Bender show that you guys are doing in June, or was planned for June. I guess it probably will, will be delayed now, but. Yeah, uh, so far we don't really know, but uh, officially it's still June. Yeah. Um, okay, let's have a look at this uh, video. So maybe we can just watch it for a minute, but if people have questions, now would be a great time to start thinking about them. Just raise your hand or put the question in the chat box and Lucy will get to you. So um, can you tell us a little bit about this uh, video that we're about to see? Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, it's, very much, it's very much a reaction between um, showing our ongoing process. So uh, like having that kind of transparency and how the, the works uh, look um, at a certain point in the process. So this is not how it looks in the final, uh, final, final stage. Uh, stage. This, and then the, the place that we are at um, here at the, at the old paper, um, the way that the, the na nature is, is a very big part of our aesthetic language and this flow of water, we just found it, it was really perfect for us to create uh, these performances. And as many of the things that we do is so intuitive, so we were just like, okay, let's, let's throw it in the water and then start acting with it uh, to see where, where does it want to go? Um, does it do something to, now it's me as a pro, uh, sitting in the chair, does it do anything to me um, uh, also visually? what kind of story can we get out of it? So it's just as well a part of the process to see uh, what does the object want to do uh, and what does, do you want to do with the object as well? So you know, along, along the, 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 the way that video evolves, you know, it, it, we, see, we see the person trying to, to find, to, to fight like against the spot to be able to read the book in between like what nature gives as a ground in the water. Is it stable? Is it not stable? Where can I find that, that comfort in society? You know, it's like almost like a, a person got, that goes to a camping spot and, and pulls out his camping chair and places it here, but then, then the sun has to move, so he moves with the sun. Uh, <laughs> yeah. a, little, a little bit that. And then, you know, like, Knowing that also today is, is a day in which people are home and have access to books and have a lot of time to think, to do things. It was important also to, to acknowledge that in, in the making. So, okay, what are these activities that also are very important to people within those moments of confinement? So, in that, in that, in that example, it's, it's outdoor, of course, but it also enacts towards uh, the things that we're able to do and find that that, that little bit of information we can here and there. And he is in constant struggle about trying to be able to find a good spot to get that information, to read it, but also to feel comfortable about it. So it's uh, a, function, a reaction towards the, the, the comfort, the function, but also the natural aspect of, of nature, the water just flowing and just not being so straight underneath, you know? You know, I also find it so poignant and powerful in relation to the current situation that the, that we're all in together. And um, one last thought that I'll share is just that the river here, the, the title of the video is Reading the River, part of this series, um, Six Act of Confinement. Um, but you can also see the river as the kind of flow of history or the flow of events that are just coming at you, whether you like it or not, and the constant attempt to adjust and then being in this position of isolation and trying to find some place of rest and comfort and calm in that situation. So to me, it seems like a very, very, um, yeah, it's a, it's a work that I think we'll look back on in 10 years is very emblematic of this moment that we're all living through. Um, so thanks for that conversation, guys. I do wanna turn to questions because we have just a few minutes. So Lucy, uh, do you wanna let us know who's on the line with questions? Um, yep, so we have Neil Aronovitz. We just unmute you. Neil, are you here? With yes, us? I am. Can you hear me? Yep, we yep. can, Neil. Thanks. Great. Thank you, and Glenn, thank you for these wonderful interviews you've been doing. Thanks a lot. Much appreciated. Um, guys, very beautiful work. Can you describe what, what, is, what is the material over the foam and what type of paint do you use? Oh, the, oh uh, we, we use many, many, many different things. Um, yeah, so we, we both use acrylic spray paint um, in new series. We're also using uh, crayons. Um, and then we normally finish off with a lac, but we experiment with so many different paints. 
You know, like, we tried. Uh, uh, I'm, I just pulled out. We just pulled out like uh, UV pigments, uh, glitters, uh, yeah. paint from a cupboard. Yeah. All these things are things that we're gonna find around and that we can use and give a little sparkle to to a thought. But um, yeah, it's a lot about uh, using acrylic paint and and acrylic colors for coloring, uh, shading, and then it's you have to protect it so it's a good layer of protection over that because you know once you start sitting over paints you know if it's not a, a good paint job like like they're doing the, in a car factory they'll have they'll need like uv protective uh, paint they'll need all these things that kind of protect a, a piece of furniture over the year so we're trying to look into okay not only doing something very aesthetical with the paint but something that can almost also last if a kid starts jumping on a chair or on a table you know <laughs> which oh, uh, <laughs> So is it, is it plaster or cement base over the foam? Is it pla plaster, cement? What kind of material goes on first? Ooh, that's also different because we, yeah, as we talked about before, we, we develop our techniques. So it also depends on which uh, specific work we're referring to. Uh, this one, uh, this one is a, is that epoxy first and then, uh, and then a, it's, it's, it's polystyrene, polystyrene and then it's a resin polyester. So yeah, yeah. Uh, it's the same process of, of, of creating uh, Boat. creating boats. Yeah. That's why it floats that's and that's why it can go in water also. So we will be, yeah. Great, thank you. <laughs> I think we have another question, Lucy. Yeah. Yes, we got um, Nesma. Yeah. Hi, Nesma. Hi, um, I just have a question. It feels like your creative process kind of subverts the linearity of your object's intentions. And it feels like your epiphanies and revelations present themselves like at any moment. So can you share a little bit about how they come about? Um, yeah, I mean, it's very, yeah, as you say, it's very much an action action process in that sense but uh, we constantly are action, re action reaction yeah yeah we, we, yeah exactly so we are constantly uh, conversating about it as well uh, i think for our new show the one uh, at, at freeman bender we we have developed it into six acts uh, and these acts are talking about different um, kind of moments of modernity that we feel like is very relevant to talk about right now um kind of like meta modernistic um, so, like one is like, for example, the classical uh, relationship, uh, the classical idea of a relationship, for example, and there we use like classical shapes, um, like for example, the tonnetia and the broyer, and explode them and melt them to kind of talk about how the how did, yeah how did the modern relationship is also really changing and and in this like kind of more liquid state now. Um, so it is something that we talk a lot about, uh, but I think the first step is always the action and then we reflect and act. So it's like, a, it's, it's not, we don't necessarily start a, a body of work saying, oh, there's a problem and let's try to shape something that can speak about the problem. We mainly will start shaping something and that automatically reveals uh, questions and reveals identity within a piece. You know, the way you're going to bend something can just make you think of that moon that is turning red on a on a super moon you know and that kind of that is going to uh, like start speaking about a situation that is happening in the exact moments uh we're living in you know yeah so you know we didn't start it, uh, uh, our upcoming exhibition in new york about the confinement but we evolved into it and we're keeping some of the aspect where we started so it's it's an evolution action reaction yeah mm. i think also the title acts of confinement is very eloquent in relation to the to what's happening right now. So the idea that confinement can also be a stage for mm -hmm. creative action. And it's something we've come back to a lot in the um, design and dialogue series of how people are using this time. And it seems like you guys are finding ways through this unprecedented situation and actually extending your thinking, extending your practice, extending your process, which is amazing to see. I think that's one of the good things, like, not one of the good things, but one of the, the things that we have been really lucky with because our practice is so uh, in flux constantly mm -hmm. and it's very, yeah, it's reactive. So, so in, in that sense, we adapt so fast um, and, and all of these things that happens around us kind of becomes a part of that process, also the limitations. 
um, there was a lot of things that we couldn't get hold of. Um, there was a lot of people we couldn't get hold of. And there's also a lot about when you are so intuitive in your work, the emotional pressure that also is about this uncertainty and, and, the, and the people that we know that, that uh, you know, in situations that are not um, that pleasant, that also flows into to the ideas and the flow of, of how we create things. Mm. Um, so, yeah, we, we came to these six acts of, of confinement as kind of, you know, some, some people want to, to, to disrupt all the time and some people want to reflect the society all the time. And I think this time we are a little bit in between, like we're reflecting some... some it's, a, it's a clear reaction. clear reaction towards stories that we're hearing all around us. You know, so. yeah. No, whether it's uh, the grandparents of somebody, or whether it's the the um, the, the couple, or, or you know, like uh, any situation that comes in are integrated and also slightly uh, uh, adapted towards one of the situation, one of the body of, body of work that are uh, set in one of the acts because there's six. Each of them talks about a different scene. You know, whether it's surreal, whether it's uh, about empowering, whether it's about uh, disrupting the, the, the social links between people. All these are like, are like kind of merging in, in, in one space. And, and I think we, we really want to, to create a performative night in which all these six acts are also activated within the, the exhibition space. Yeah, amazing. Well, that's uh, something for us to look forward to when we can all get to Chelsea again. <laughs> um, well, thanks, guys, so much for this. This has been an amazing conversation. Uh, I hope listeners will come back on Friday for Ron Arid. And then also uh, Monday, we have the British uh, London-based curator, Libby Sellers, who will be joining us. Uh, so otherwise, uh, thank you guys so much. And uh, stay safe out there. Keep, keep up the great work. It's been amazing if to talk to you. If anybody has questions, just like, please reach DM and everything. Yeah, we'll be very happy to answer them. Send us some stuff. Yeah, yeah we all. <laughs> You're easy to find. <laughs>